that, where are the tweets that the Trump administration wanted to have taken down? I mean, look, as far as I'm concerned, you can pr print everything. Let everyone know what's going on. That's how I see it. Yeah, people keep asking me that. I I made a point of re reporting in the very first Twitter files that I had heard that. Um, and I heard it by from enough sources that even though I didn't have it, like I wasn't looking at, you know, requests from the from the Trump administration. I was that's just straight out reporting that people told me. Um, but people have to understand how the this process works. We were doing targeted searches from the very beginning, looking at something very specific, which was the relationship between Twitter and the intelligence agencies. So the the stuff that we turned up, and that was still an enormous volume of, of things, um, you didn't have requests from the, 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 the Trump White House in it. Uh, we did occasionally find other stuff in there. Like we found something from Adam Schiff uh, because we were, another search term collided with that. And we found something with Angus King uh, because of that. Um, but we, we, we couldn't find, we don't have the thing that people are asking us to disclose. I don't have, I have no doubt that they're in there, but people have to understand that this is, this data set is enormous. It's it's as big as a, the number of grains on a beach, of sand on a beach. And we're looking at a tiny, tiny handful of, of tweets that are only representative about certain things. Um, if we had it, of course I'd, I'd publish it. I want the clicks as much as anybody else does, but we just- How we just dare don't. you? How dare you try to expand your platform? No, 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 no. <laughs> and that's the argument that and that is the argument that, uh, you know, friends in the chat are making, which is why print why print anything if it isn't going to show everything? It's like, yeah, you have some very uh, pertinent information that the American public should hear. But because it is slanted, don't release it unless you're going to show everything. And I'm thinking you guys are still not getting that the system is completely corrupt. It doesn't yeah. matter what <laughs> side you're on. And if yeah. what happened with SVB is any indication, if anyone is paying attention, it happened. It, Biden agreed to buy to buy them to basically bail out the entire operation in less than 24 hours. It did, they didn't even th they didn't even discuss it. They're not even going to have Senate hearings or anything of the like. No. SVB comes out and says we need. Tens of billions of dollars to prevent an even bigger catastrophe for the economy. Give us the money. And so I'm thinking, what, does anything else truly matter if this is how the uh, this is going to be operated in this capacity? So as we do wind down the conversation, we'd love to get your thoughts on SVB and how that more or less is a microcosm of, of the rot that is this system, regardless if it's the red team or the blue team. Well, again, I, I spent you know, almost a decade covering the fallout from the 2008 financial crisis. And I remember the heady days when banks like Lehman Brothers, um, Bank of America, you know, there was, there was a whole long list of them, Washington Mutual, that were either about to collapse or collapse, you know, had already collapsed. And the process took longer then, um, you know, it, it, it took... Uh, a few days in some cases, and then like a month and uh, for, for the much bigger bailout. But still, the basic response was, let's just plug the hole with massive amounts of public treasure, and then we'll worry about the fallout later. And they didn't really ask the public for it, uh, for, for their permission. They just created a whole bunch of Fed facilities that, you know, we didn't learn about until Bernie and uh, Rand Paul uh, managed to get an audit, audit the Fed bill through uh, that, you know, told us about $16 trillion worth of lending that went through that year. Um, look, this is the way they, the, their strategy with this stuff is, is uh, consistent going back to the 80s. Whenever these idiots on Wall Street do something really, really stupid, uh, the Fed or, or the Treasury steps in it makes everybody well again. One of my sources called it drink, you know, allowing them to drink themselves sober. Um, and you, you just give them a ton of money 
make sure that everybody gets back up to getting their bonuses. And, and then you worry about the down, the downstream effects, which usually involve things like 5 million people a year getting foreclosed upon, which is what happened after 2008. Um, it, it's, it's, it's always take care of the rich idiots first. And, and then <laughs> later on, um, you know, the pain comes and that's unreported. So I, I imagine that's, what's going to be the pattern in this case. Sorry, I mean, that's depressing, but yeah. no, it's it's just it's ridiculous. The whole thing's a circus. And I and, you know, some people sort of fall into it when they they actually hear this and they think, well, they're spending the money on that. But then why can't we have good things as if somehow there's a pie and it isn't a pie? Right. We could have all the things, but yet it is still infuriating that they're putting out the, the idea that we can't afford things and yet simultaneously, but yet they can afford to do that. Um, it's absurd. And then they wonder why, well, they can't build their moats wide enough. I keep saying it. You wonder people like Nancy Pelosi, why would someone break into my house? I don't know, Marie Antoinette. This is like, <laughs> this is just, we're, this is absurd at this point with these people. You can see, you can see why Jen and Katie are so friendly with each other. They have the same, the same. I'm, it's like, I'm just livid about all of this. I can't, I just yeah. can't with her. And, and here's something I don't understand. And maybe anybody can answer this. So you're called in voluntarily to go talk to these people who, by the way, are our employees. Okay. So mm -hmm. they work for us. Okay. So you're called in, you voluntarily showed up. And this is a question I would have specifically for Debbie, because to be honest, that was the only bit I watched because I can't stomach that kind of ridiculous nonsense, but why so hostile? Why are they treating this like it's some sort of litigation? I don't understand. Like if you were coming in voluntarily to talk to us, so why are they all so angry and hostile? Why? I don't understand. I'm seriously asking somebody, please tell me why they're acting like litigators when this is a voluntary person coming in for your own inquiry. I well, really I, don't know. Honestly, I think it's just representative of the, this, this issue that we're looking at. Like, they don't consider that there is such a thing as a as a legitimate alternative point of view in these cases. So, you know, in the, in the same way that they will decide that 3000 names need to be removed from Twitter, they just they just go for the, you know, how do we destroy these witnesses? How do we destroy this information? How do we make sure that it's discredited? Um Whereas, again, I think there is an intellectual discussion to be had. These are hard issues. Like, what do you do about hate speech on the Internet? What do you what do you do about uh, pornography and, you know, and foreign threats? For, for That's a real thing. You do have you do have to think about that. But they've they don't want to have that conversation because then it would bring eyes to what they've already done. And um, they, I guess I don't think they they want the public to know about that. Yeah. I well, I just figure, honestly, if they're that angry about if you would, if you're going to get that angry about your secrets getting out, then you ought not be doing those things. That's my <laughs> thought. Like if there's something you don't want people to know, probably you ought not be doing that. That's probably just, just my yep. thought. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Thank you so much. Matt, no, for coming you. on and, and coming. I mean, we're small but mighty, but I really appreciate your time and coming on here. I mean, and I felt sort of sad watching you and Michael sitting there and having to listen <laughs> to, to, to that. Um, she's really horrible. And I like on behalf of other people in South Florida, we apologize I, for her. I, and I am sure, you know, and again, she she may be the nastiest person in all of Congress. Um, she really <laughs> wears ridiculous. that badge uh, it, like like it's of honor. And the one thing that because I, you know, I know her and I've been around her multiple times. Um, one thing I can tell you is that she has that habit of basically letting you know that I, she's very tiny, but she wants you to know that she walks tall and carries a big stick. So when she says something and then pauses for a second, as if to suggest that it has now been granted you the opportunity to, to speak, that, excuse me, I'm reclaiming my time, I'm talking. That's, that's her way of basically trying to stick it to you. That's not about the professional candor or anything like that, but that's basically saying, as has been quoted to us by a very noted person in the Florida Democratic Party, uh, Debbie has a propensity when she's trying to basically make her presence known, saying, and I quote, I'm Debbie Wasserman Schultz and I always get what I want. And that... <laughs> 
Can't really say I'm too surprised. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.